Good morning, Uber Busters, or whenever you happen to be listening. Uh, wherever you happen to be listening, I hope it's going well. This is Liam Billingham, co-host of Uber Busters, and today's episode is on a killing, the killing of a Chinese bookie. Um, before we jump in, I want to read a quick review. We've been getting a few more reviews, and we always need more, and we want to highlight these reviews. So, this review is from January. And it's by Jordan, so to speak. And Jordan gave us five stinking stars and said, fun, listen, and informative. Usually, I find podcasts about movies to be overly pretentious. Agreed, Jordan, so to speak. This is a very laid-back conversation between a couple of really funny, clever guys who clearly love movies and have done their homework. Really shed some light on a movie that I had just seen and not quite understood. Highlighted the good, the bad, and the confusing. Highly recommended. When's the MeUndies sponsorship happening? Jordan, so to speak, that's a good question. We thank you for the review. It's really great to hear back from those listening, and we hope this inspires others to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And also get in touch with us at oeuvrebusters at gmail.com. Send us an email, and uh, we're also on Instagram, oeuvrebusters, and we're on Twitter, oeuvrebusters. We're in all those places. Get in touch. We'd love to hear from you with positive, negative, whatever feedback you got. Okay, I'll leave you now. Enjoy the show. I'm Liam Billingham. And I'm George Fogopoulos. And this is Uvra Busters. Oh, I always Busters. get to. I always get Busters. 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 Damn it. What's fuck? Uh, maybe we can just kind of quickly recap what this film's about. This film's about Cosmo Vitelli. So Cosmo Vitelli. Uh, Small pr- clone pr- club owner. Proprietor. Of proprietor. A, what you might call a... Um, crazy Horse West. A, a crazy horse west the a strip club <laughs> no he calls it crazy horse west <laughs> no 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 no. he does call it crazy horse west um interesting fact too that the this place was um the place used the casavetti's uses was actually called gazari's uh were on you sunset. F- oh you were serious about that yeah, when you tweeted it i tweeted it yeah but uh true story interesting uh and this isn't my joke but i'm, I'm stealing it from the um the lovely tina fey but uh as this film as this film was on my tv um i'm pretty sure that uh my tv caught an std because this Jesus nightclub, Christ. this nightclub is grimy. It's pretty dirty. <laughs> it is. So, so he's a small club owner, small and club he owner. gets gets in deep with some uh, with some uh, loan sharks. Loan sharks or ca- casino proprietors might be a better. They they own a casino. So the film. Oh right, but are those the same guys? Is that the same guy that he's that's collecting money from him? You mean the guy who? So the film, be- yeah. So the film begins with him paying off a debt, and that's you right. find out that he's been kind of in hawk to these other Dudes, gangsters of yeah. these loan sharks for seven years right the film pretty much begins with him paying off his debt and then he proceeds <laughs> to go gambling with, <laughs> a, with, a, with an entourage of, of women right uh, one of whom is his girlfriend one of rachel yeah uh, um i believe uh, i believe the actress's name is azizi johari that's correct and he has a pretty close relationship with her and her mother it right. seems like you know these, he's got all these women in his life but he's he seems to be a one woman man but he brings all these women who work at his strip club to a uh, casino. And at that casino, he loses. He goes in the hole 23,000 oh. clams. Did you? Uh, he, they do say clams, Do actually. they say clams? No, they don't say clams. Oh, Did you do the math, by the way? Did you, uh, do you know how much that would be in today's money? No, I didn't Some fucking do that. That's $23,000. <laughs> is $23,000. Jesus Christ. Like, well, when you adjust for inflation. I did. I swear to God, I adjusted. How much was it? It was like over 100 grand. Fuck, fuck, sh- fuck, fuck. And they say that. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> a lot of money after finding out that he's twenty three thousand dollars in debt or after coming to terms with that he um, spends a significant portion of the film seemingly avoiding them until they come to the club and go listen we need you to we need you to help us uh get get to this 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 chinese guy who uh, seems to also be involved in some illicit right illicit things eventually that doesn't really work out he sort of hesitates so they ask him to kill him and Cosmo is given a gun and a and a and an unmarked car, and Correct. sent out into the L.A. night, and uh, he kills the guy along with a few other people. Right, and then he finds out um, he's a fall guy. Right, because he wasn't killing just a regular old bookie. bookie. He's killing a Chinese mob boss. Was, yeah, and uh, the mob then comes after him. Um, he fights them off. He kills them both, or he kills Seymour Cassell. And then the film kind of uh, then ends back at the club with Cosmo kind of, to some degree, coming to grips with, I guess, with the situation that's kind of unfolded. And who he is. Yeah, and who he is and his kind of like own mortality. And then this version of the film, and I actually don't know how the other version of the film ends. I uh, don't either. On a somewhat ambiguous note where you also find out that he's been wounded. 
He walks out of the club. Well, we know he's been wounded because he goes back to Rachel's house with the bullet with the wound blood, yeah. down, but then leaves and goes to the club. Right. Um, and then he, it ends with kind of um, Mr. Sophistication. Who's the, the MC. cabaret singer. And, no, yeah, yeah. At his club singing and being humiliated on stage right. by, by the women. And you don't know exactly what Vitelli's fate is. Does he die? Is the mob going to come after him and kill him? Because obviously... He's killed some of their guys. Is the Chinese mob going to come and kill him? There's a lot of open ends. There's a lot of open ends. He's, he's a dead man at the end of yeah. the movie. And, um, that, and that's the film, pretty much, as far as plot goes. Thank you very much for listening. As, um, as usual, with Cassavetti's films, the plot is not like the important thing. Though, I think this film of, of is the is this is the first John Cassavetti's movie that fits, feels like it fits a, almost squarely into a genre. Yes, I'm glad you said that. Which too. is the domestic horror film. No, it's um <laughs> I was really obsessed with domestic horror films when I was like 28. I was like, "What a cool idea." That's more like I Mini love, Moskowitz. I love Antichrist so much, bro. Um no, uh it's a crime drama. Yeah, it's like a kind of I mean, not conventional in a uh, bad way, but it's kind of like your conventional L.A. film noir. Well, it it hangs on a an, an, on a plot. On a plot, yeah. That maybe, but it's also woman under the loose. influence doesn't, and husbands doesn't in, a, in any traditional sense. Um, let's let's get let's go through it. So, uh, what let's, what do you think this movie is about? What are the what are the th- what's going what are the themes here, George? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so many themes. Who sure. Can, who can keep track? Um, um th- there's the theme of uh, stolen cars. Okay. There's the theme of uh, uh hamburgers that's when he has to or- all subjects. He has to order the hamburgers. Oh shit, we got to go through scene by scene because yeah. we forget about these amazing oh. little encounters. Um so the movie opens uh how does the movie the movie oh the movie opens in an extraordinarily Paint the picture con- for us. no, in an extraordinarily contemporary way. I think this opening shot it just it cuts in, there's no fade in it just <laughs> into Cosmo Vitelli, played by Ben Gazzara, in a performance that I think is like absolutely towering, incredible, just standing outside his club. And he yeah. stands there for a minute, and he turns and he walks, and the camera pans with him. And I thought a lot about like uh, specifically films of the Romanian new wave the past ten years. I know it sounds crazy, Shut but just up. like they just start. Wait, in and you were aware that or, or you were pretentious earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a big <laughs> fan of. For those that don't know. I love myself a Romanian. It's my favorite. It's are my, you, are you, it's my are favorite you trying summer. to paint a picture no. of like the death of Mr. Lazarescu? Well, it, it is. It, uh, I don't know about Lazarescu because yeah, I don't know if that's like the perfect example of that's the easy choice, but I'm thinking a little that's more the mainstream a police choice. adjective sort of choice <laughs> or a, um, for those of us that spend our time watching the later uh, Christy Puyu films. Right. Um, no, but it just, it starts kind of in the middle of action. Yeah. We're not given a lot of time to, we're not given a lot of, uh, there's no scene where it's like, Cosmo Vitale is a small club owner. Right. <laughs> like that kind of thing. And the first line in the movie is, it'll pick up Teddy. Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. talking like, to, don't the, worry, he's Teddy, talking to the doorman up. who might be Andre the Giant's dad. Oh, very good. Uh, deep cut. Deep, deep cuts. Deep, deep cut. And um, we instantly have a sense of where we are. We have a sense of a seedy kind of place. There's a lot of black in this movie. Black meaning there's a lot of darkness in this movie. And uh, he goes inside the club and... And we see him at work. And what's he do? Well, he basically uh, introduces the girls um, and kind of gives them a minute or two to like get off the stage, get dressed, um, run back out on the stage. So what's really also interesting about this... He's the club owner, film. but he also directs the numbers, yes. and like he's a bit of a he's a bit of like a theater s- or a theater filmmaker. director yeah. or a filmmaker. So some of the research, and actually, so one good thing about us uh, delaying the recording because of, this of my funny tummy is that I was you able to. Going on. You should see the face Liam's making right now when he says that. <laughs> is that I was able to actually do some research and using that, uh, putting quotes on that into this film. So I read um, the chapter on Cassavetes on Cassavetes. From Ray from, Carney's from book. Ray we Carney gotta get book. Ray Carney on the show. We do, yeah. Him, and, I mean, maybe. You think he'd want to be on the show? I don't know. I mean, Marty's been on the show for like seven weeks How long? Now, and he's not do, he's not had, hasn't said a fucking word. That's crazy. And I just want to talk about silence. And this, silence is, the episode, this no is the fucking episode where you can talk. No one, uh, no one has seen silence. I'm the only person alive who's seen the movie. Is this, by the way, came out in the same year uh, that uh, Taxi Driver came False. out. False. Wait. No, so Taxi Driver came out in 1977. So I heard, I remember reading in the maybe in the Carney book maybe it was lying that this that Taxi Driver came out like a week or two after this did and like kind of like somewhat similar films. I thought it was no, they're not. I thought this was uh, I thought this, this was, was earlier. Six. Yeah, but I think Taxi Driver seventy seven. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm spreading misinformation. Well, why don't you look it up at the in the John Cassavetes, uh encyclopedia? 
Yeah. So he basically, yeah, not kind of like MCs, but he gets on the mic and kind of like introduces. But yes, he's like a showman. He's ba- so he's backstage. He's like which is significant. We don't see his face. We only hear his voice. The the people in the crowd only hear his right. voice. But it's also great too because the first time you see him kind of like talking and buying time for the girls, you hear people in the background like, "Get off!" The, like, shut up. And Show what's us interesting, the girls. What's interesting about that is he kind of ignores them because in the scene he's like, "Well, that was." That was lady blah blah blah, and she's 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 from Paris, and these people are like, show us the boobs, <laughs> yeah. and he ignores it because I think that this guy believes in showmanship. Yes, he totally. believes in, the, and he, despite owning a a, a a a strip club, he believes in like decorum and being a gentleman and all these things that that are like, that like make for a meaningful night at, at like a at like a club he thinks he's an artist he's, yeah and well, he views in himself the way as he an artist. is and like it's interesting too because he's got taste in his mind when he pays off um the first guy he says to him something well he's now he's able to kind of like talk freely to him because he's paid him off and he says something like, like you're you know, a bum yeah he's like you're a bum he's like you got no style and apparently one of the things uh, that i read in the carney book is that the uh, the that guy has no style is very much based on uh, Gazara and that like, Gazara was kind of like very much interested in like I don't know like being a showman being like the loudest voice in the room um, which is so funny because there's something like I think Ben Gazara Ben Gazara does this thing with his eyes he does it in this movie at the end he looks he blinks down them? he blinks but he, he looks down in I such a method. way that like he's so <laughs> you're such an asshole he's so <laughs> like he's he's very pr- like he he's as an actor he actually takes the time to think you can see Ben Gazzara thinking on screen, especially in this film and in Dogville, which he's in much later, um, in a way that I've almost never seen an actor take. Like, There's a moment when he's, he has a speech at the end of the film in front of an audience, and he kind of does this thing where he looks down, and you can see him. Maybe he's thinking of what his line is, whatever's going on, but it's like he's so thoughtful as an actor, like both in, in I think, his choices, but also like in the way that he actually presents himself on screen. Serious question, though. Isn't that a sign of being uh ill prepared like why were those thoughts not already kind of processed before let's say shooting the scene i mean i think that really depends on what you think about acting right like i think um especially when you're dealing with a director who probably wanted to create an environment where anything could happen i think that um you know i think i think a good actor in my opinion a good actor will use the instability of of losing the moment as a as a way to regroup on camera and also the other thing to keep in mind is that any other director may have cut that cut would cut would probably cut to another angle but that's not how true that's not how jc rolls no but i think um it's interesting that he'd be based on gazara because gazara kind of seems like a loud mouth and this character is so reserved and so I, reserved and i didn't think about it till afterwards Harry's a lot more out there oh yeah totally and i was like this what well, that's one thing also that really struck me about because we spent a lot of time obviously talking about like masculinity and kind of uh, representations toxic of masculinity. Toxic masculinity. And sometimes toxic masculinity. Toxic <laughs> so masculinity. I love that Britney Spears song, by the way. That is actually a legitimately great it is. song. Uh, I love. Um, you're, we're not, you're not fucking around. I no, no, I, no. I'm serious. It's I an incredible song. Yeah. Um, but um, do you think it's funny how like pretentious people are like, I hate Britney Spears except for toxic. Except for toxic. Whereas I say I hate Britney Spears except for toxic and email my heart, yeah. which is from her first record. Do you I know, have you ever heard email my heart? You know what I've not actually. At the end of this episode, I'm going to read you the lyrics to email my heart. Oh my God, that'd be amazing. Is that off of the first album? It's track number nine off the first album. Wow. Yes, that's correct. That album's like, the, uh, was it it's just turned 20 years old or something? Wow. <laughs> he, views him, he views himself as an artist. That's true. He does. He views himself <laughs> as, a, as an artist. That's true. Um, so then the next scene, um, cuts to, yeah, him paying off his debt, which this is one of the first moments in the movie where I was sort of blown away by, you know, I think that there's a rough and tumble. I've said from the beginning, like a lot of people watch, think of Cassavetti's movies as movies where he kind of just points the cameras at actors and lets it go. But like, there's a lot of fucking cinema in this movie. And one of the things that's really great is there's that long track as he, as Gazzara walks over to sit with the guy and it's just beautiful. And it's, The first time we've seen L.A. painted in such like a like a sunburnt kind of light. Yeah. Minnie and Moskowitz didn't really have More s- of the scenes, scenes in the morning. Like right. Yeah. But sorry, that's what I want to say. Going back to this kind of talk about his performance and his performances as a type of masculinity. It is really restrained. That was like five minutes ago. Sorry. There's only one moment in which and that's kind of later on in the movie where he kind of like gets really loud with the mom with the mom. Yeah. And ev- throughout the entire film, it's like you could tell like I'm glad you said this. Um we said about it, like you could see him processing his thoughts and his feelings and his emotions. 
And that never kind of stops throughout the entire film. You mean he he does like in the sense it's very restrained, like it's yeah. very much a performance of interiority. Yep. And it's like clearly like on screen. So after we see him uh, pay this guy off and kind of give him a hard time, call him like you know you have no style, whatever. The next thing we see is him in a limo, correct, with his driver, correct, who, and going around and picking up these various women who work for him who work for him uh, did you notice the touch that when they get in the limo he offers them champagne it's a champagne bottle from like a previous rider no he's like i think this bottle of champagne is open i'm like <laughs> he, he say I, that i think I so like that. there's something that's like it's very clear he i think it's already been popped like i think he just kind of like rented the limo and well, it's really like, it seems like he's trying to take them to prom because he's giving them um what's it like cro- uh, what's it called uh, not crochets corsages 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 Actually, I got you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you for our... Uh, email my heart. E- email. <laughs> um, and so these women come out. And the women come out. And then you find... I guess you don't... I guess... Do you find out that, that Rachel was his um, girlfriend? Well, you time? see him go in ambiguous. and meet the families of the other wives. And the first time I... I mean, the, sorry. Well, the you see wives. him and go in and meet the, of the girlfriends. And for a minute, you're like, is he dating all these women? Ye- yeah. Which he isn't. No, he's He's not. kind of only dating Rachel, who um, is one of the women. She's black. And he takes some time to actually talk to his mother. So it's clear that her when mother, he meets yeah. w- her mother, when he meets the family of another character, it's sort of, there's a little bit of distance, but it's very clear with Rachel's mother, right. who's just called mama, that there's a closeness. So it's sort of clear that it's his, that maybe it's his girlfriend. Yeah. And then they go to this underground Shady gambling. Time. Yeah. <laughs> Not a great uh, look. And and um, again, you don't exactly see him like lose the money, but you find out that he he's lost like a shit ton of money. I wrote twenty three thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars. Twenty, I said twenty three. Twenty three. Yeah. Do you know what that is now? Adjusted for inflation. No, please help. Over a hundred thousand dollars. Whoa! Yeah. If somebody had thought of actually like like doing that during while they were watching this film, I'd be like, that person's amazing. Yeah, they've like <laughs> the thinking that goes behind that. But they smell bad, so it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and there's sort of this scene where he's playing and the women are bored. I love the scenes in this movie that are like kind of viewed through the. L- there's two scenes in a row here that are sort of like viewed through the lens of the women. Ye- okay, to like some extent. Scene? Well, yeah, the, it immediately cuts to yeah, cuts them, from them in the car at the bathroom in the bathroom, and they seem kind of bored. Yeah, and they're like, oh, so they're, and they're kind of bickering, but which is something that they seem to do throughout the movie. But it's interesting. It's interesting whose perspectives he chooses to seem to take I- throughout the film. Uh, in this scene, it's the women, and then they, after they're in the bathroom together, they go back out and they sit at the table, sort of around him. And it's it's interesting to note that he kind of brings this like entourage of women, yeah, and nobody well, else there has. Everyone else is kind of like there to gamble, and correct. he seems to. Another moment is I think there's a little bit of self deception in this character about what's classy and like oh, where's yeah, a classy totally. place no, no, to no, bring no. people. Yeah. He's clearly trying to kind of, um, I don't know, play the. In in today's common parlance, like the pimp. Yeah, l- yeah. He He's trying is. to be this kind of like bigger than life dude, and it's also really fascinating too because literally the scenes juxtaposed like, okay, I'm done with this debt. I've just finished paying off this debt of seven and years. I'm gonna go get. I'm gonna go spend a. So like, money. I'm gonna go spend a shit ton of money to see legal gambling done. So he illegal lo- gambling. Illegal yeah. gambling. So he lo- <laughs> he oh he lo- he loses um a shit ton of money. Um, there's also this really funny scene before he gets kind of, um, so after he loses the money, yeah, he gets to go wait in a room where they talk to the other, there where like all the people who lost money at this illegal casino have to talk and And there's a a scene scene. with this doctor. And again, this scene is from his wife's perspective. The camera is mostly on the wife of the doctor and she's like, what the fuck? And he's like, oh, I'm a doctor. Yeah. You should take me very seriously. And he makes fun of his like job and he's like, he's like, that's no, uh, that's yeah. no way to make, make fun of a man's profession. <laughs> and the wife's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? These men could kill you. Yeah, he's like, they wouldn't kill she me. She literally says that, these men could kill you. And then So this guy owes a couple of grand too. 5,000. And he's like, he's like, how about 31 days? And the guy goes, how about now? <laughs> It's really, it's really scary. It's a oh, scary scene. There's scary. some really scary scenes in that this movie. But yeah, the wives are co- wives slash the girlfriends are kind of, and you know, av- uh, are kind of voices of reason. And after Minnie and Moskowitz, it's a, not disappointing, but there's less. The women in the film, the women in this film, are slightly more like peripheral to the main action of this story. Mm. And it's there's no Jenna Rowlands. Yeah. There's no mini. Rachel's There's a Lady Rowlands in this. The Lady Rowlands. Lady Rowlands. Hello. That was the, the first uh, woman that's picked up. I believe that's the Lady Rowlands' house. Oh, that's right. Lady Rowlands' mom. Don't. Mm. Once again. Yeah. What? Why'd the you Lady Rowlands. 
What'd you go? Because mm? she's no. I dun, 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 dun. Oh, I th- it sounded like you were doing like. Ah. I'm having a stroke. I was like Led Zeppelin. <laughs> oh, from the immigrant song. I fucking do, love that. Do um do the do that do that. Oh. Email my heart and say I love Will <laughs> Um You've ruined one of the greatest so songs geez. of all time, yeah, and I mean email my heart. Overrated. Not, <laughs> not how I dare do you say think that? Led about, Zeppelin's a little overrated. About right? Britney. So no, they're fucking amazing. So. <laughs> And Ze- I <laughs> my, if I had a dime for every time I heard one of uh, 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 a rambunctious teenager in the street just yelling Zeppelin in Brooklyn, yeah, um, yeah, oh, I'm kidding. Um, um, so he then gets pulled into the room, and the mobster's like, "You owe us a shit ton of money," and he's like, "And he's like, well, I don't want to have that much money in the bank." Notice <laughs> how they don't strong arm him the way they strong arm the guy who's five. Though. They're very civil with him. They are, very, you know, which is really funny too. Cause at some point, they literally break out paperwork, and I wrote like, "Oh my god, does the mob really they're use mob paperwork?" Bureaucracy. They're like, they're like, here, sign these, sign these three documents that say that you owe us this money. Can we pause for a second and talk about the fucking stacked cast? Of gangsters here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Timothy uh, Carey, who you might remember as guy who takes bite of uh, Seymour Moskowitz's God. hot dog in Minnie and Moskowitz. vomited in. And Timothy Carey, we don't really have time to it. get into it uh, here, but again. he's a... What? Timothy Carey's a really interesting guy. Um, Apparently him and Cassell did not get along. Well, way to... Spoiler alert, Seymour so. Cassell is in this movie playing another mobster. Um, and you know, the first time I watched this movie, I really thought he was like a charming guy and watching it a second time. I was like, that guy's a piece of shit. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. And then Bob, great job. Bob Woodward, I forget his name, but a uh, really good actor who plays a guy with a tight mouth. Who, yeah. Who, the kind of man who did not live past the eighties and we don't, there's a <laughs> lot of like, mm, there's a, this movie is an interesting document document of like men prior to the, like that kind of man's man kind of thing. You know, that the quality huh. of the way that they're all kind of, they, they look like, Ben is probably like that, 44 in this movie, and he could be my grandpa. Like, he just oh, looks like older. There's a maturity. Look, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, he kind of politely signs some papers. He says, I don't have the money now, but I'll get it to you. And they seem to believe him, and they seem to be okay with it. Probably because the longer he's out, the more they can... Fuck around with him, yeah. Vig him, too. Like yeah, they can do whatever the hell they want. Vig is the original room. I haven't watched Get Shorty in a long time. No, the Vig is, isn't like, Vig isn't, isn't a fancy name for interest. Yeah, maybe. That's what I was guessing. I don't know. So he makes that out alive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the, um, he, the, all the girls go. Um, I, do, do we see that scene where he kind of takes them all back home? We see maybe with Rachel. He yes. Says he takes them all back home. And, and there's a scene with Rachel where she's like, hey, I could come with you and back he's to like, the club. And he's like, no, I got to do some things. Well, he says that he actually says, I'm going to go get some money and bring it back there. Like, I think he's going to go to the bank and take like right. five grand and give it to them. And he end up, ends up going to breakfast. And then. And then he's about, it seems like I was actually, I really like movies where people eat. So it's always a bummer in my and bummer in my mind that like he's I'm like, <laughs> he oh, he's get a gonna, chance or to he's going to order like a, like a, like breakfast. Yeah. yeah. And He's going to uh, order a hot dog, a coffee, and a beer. Oh, the greatest order. Did I ever tell you about my friend, uh, Kevin Condardo? Shout out to my buddy, Kevin Condardo. Had right, an idea, you have friends. We had get an it. idea for a podcast called Grand Slam, <laughs> where you go to fancy, <laughs> you go to like fancy Brooklyn um, eateries, eateries, and you order, a, you order, you, you keep modifying your order until it's very clear you're ordering a Grand Slam, <laughs> and you see if the, the people the person get like, it. like you're kind of like, oh, I'm going to have the breakfast hash, but instead of hash, can I get pancakes, two eggs? <laughs> Yeah, sure. And then can I get an, a side order of sausage and a side order of bacon? Yeah. Can I also get a side order of toast? And, <laughs> and do you have those little, like, individual grape packages? And that's when they're like, are you ordering a Grand Slam? <laughs> like, ding, 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 ding. But I like, I like, m- I especially like movies where people have breakfast at, like, after they've been up all night. I, I don't know. There's something about that. It's something, it's comforting. It's something it's very a, comforting. It's life affirming. And the fact that instead he, this waitress who must work, at, this waitress that works Wor- at, the, at diner the diner that he goes to, which is down the street from the club, is like, can I audition for you? And they go back to the club. Uh, yeah. And he's like, sure. Why the hell not? So then she does this like kind of really awkward dance she for him. She comes out topless. Um, and she's running around. And he's stage. like, slow down. He's, he's like, just like, walk what? across yeah, the stage. Stop jumping. Stop jumping. And then Rachel walks Rachel. in. And this is the first time we get a sense that maybe this is something of a serious relationship. Right, because she's clearly jealous. And she, she hits she, him. She, she hits both of them. She hits her, too, and she runs away. She gets dressed. She leaves. The girl. The girl. Rachel's still there. Yeah. And then they have, like, this really interesting scene. And this is also the scene where he says, like, I'm a club owner. I deal in girls. This is what I do. And there's a long yeah. shot of, the ba- of his back as he's, like, holding her down. It's a really interesting way to photograph 
it. It's almost like he's holding her down, trying to get her to come, trying to get her to take some cordial or brandy. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I forgot he like. It's a very some, weird. Yeah. It's a very weird scene. It's also the first. So I think that one of the things that sort of my my there's a big moment a little bit later in the movie, but I think it's worth talking about now. Where, well, let's so let's 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 come to let's the end. But it. I think that this is the first moment where I think um, it's revealed that there's a there's an edge to this guy that we didn't know was previously there. And the later way on, yeah, he forces to or forces her to take this drink. Like he's still very mannered and very yeah. controlled. And I also think it speaks to what the movie might be about politically, which I think there's a very s- political element to this film. Totally, yeah. And it's funny too because I mean I, I we've talked about this before about how so much of like the politics of the decade of like the 60s to the 70s of the decades are not really explicitly addressed in these films until this one until maybe. this one but again maybe i mean i would say definitely but also like in a very kind of um adjacent do you want to talk about that now um you well, maybe we we're almost there too yeah okay so what so if we're talking about the same scene i think not, we might we're not i'm really excited scene. to see if we are right so, so then the next the step. aliens attack and then the today t- we celebrate our independence day i was, I was going with starship troopers and i was like and you could really tell that that's society a great is movie fascistic. in less than an hour planes from it that's independence day <laughs> so then um what's the next scene so um so he yeah so they have the scene where they kind of reconcile it's also by the way interesting too because and i'm glad also that it's not really commented on but also we have like an interracial couple here and it's not like again another example of there's no there's no scene where he's like hey I'm cool with black people right like yeah, yeah, like yeah. it might be in it's another not, movie yeah it doesn't it's not like no. heavy handed it just like it is what it he is he comes off as such a saint the first time you watch this movie in a weird way Ben Gazzara to me he seems like such a good guy huh it was yeah, my well, first I mean, reading well he's very much like a tragic figure and either in the sense that because he views himself. Like it's yeah. it's very much kind of like the epitome of, of of tragedy, right? Like he views himself in this kind of like elevated heroic manner, and it's really very much like totally about like his downfall. Yes, which is not exactly Aristotelian tragedy, but it's close enough. Oh, there's a unity of strip club. So then, um, so then we g- we all know that the the Aristotle is the unity yeah. of strip club in time. Of, of course, my question. Thought that joke would be funny time, the second time. Time, time, time dance and nudity. Dance. Yeah, oh. well, the strip club. Yeah, yeah. Of course. So then the mob Time, dance, comes. Nudity, that could be like a class you teach in this play. Totally, of course, yeah. Hmm. So then the mob. So so like they're back to business at the club. The ladies are on stage. We have one. We're treated to our first scene with Mister Sophistication. Mister like Sophistication. Who's sort of singing a song about? Um, Talk about a clown. Paris. This is the so there's oh, a, num- the a Paris, Paris number. number, and it's like they're sort of talking about being in Paris, and there's you know, really interesting scenes, but also like one thing that I kind of love about this movie is it's kind of about a community theater. <laughs> and it's, it's and I think that's really cool. And I think that one thing that m- this makes this movie unique. You know, the first time I watched this film, I don't know if I believe this this anymore. But the first time I watched this film, I was like, this movie is not given enough. Like, why is this movie not getting more? This is like, this is as good as as good as fucking Taxi Driver. This is this movie is amazing. Yeah. It's truly amazing. And it's like it's it's almost forgot. Like, because a lot of dude bros. I know The Godfather is a great movie, but, yeah. but I'm also persistently annoyed when people say like that's my favorite movie. As you know, amazing of a movie, it's as funny because it uh, ca- sorry because Casavetti shit talks The Godfather in uh, the Carney book. Really? Yeah. Well, in the sense that he basically says like something along the lines of um, he kind of dismisses it in the sense of I think of its original kind of like material. The book is it, shit. I forget exactly. Well, the book is shit, but I think he's he says something. Take really that, dismissive. Mario Puzo. <laughs> he's rolling. Come at me, grave. bro. <laughs> Where he's like, <laughs> where he's kind of like the the Amerapuzo fan club is not gonna, it's not gonna be happy with us on Twitter. But I mean, I think that he would probably view the Godfather Godfather as like a as like kind of a an empty entertainment. I think that that's exactly what he, he said. Whether you think that's I'm not saying that's true at all. I'm a huge fan of the Godfather. It's a great movie, but it is more of it's like that classic idea of like the Godfather's a movie, whereas Killing of a Chinese Bookie is a film, which. I'm not saying I ascribe to that, but I could see that being the sort of like boring. Right. And I think one of his criticisms actually, again, in the Carney book is that he says that gangsters are actually rather boring. And he's Oh, interesting. And he says something along the lines of like, what can I possibly say to a gangster? Why would I want to hang out with a gangster? He's like, they're boring people. And I think he, he says something along the lines of like, 
Because he aligns them also with businessmen and with studio suits. I think Francis Ford Coppola knows that gangsters are boring too because it is a movie about family as opposed to gangsters. Uh-huh. And I think that that's a... I mean, I don't think it would be the movie it is without it being about a lot more than just gangsterism or gangster. And it also is a political film. There's politics yeah. in The Godfather. Like, I think, unfortunately, it's like a victim of its own reputation. It's such a good movie, but it's, it's a also movie, like... Yeah. It also has a sequel that's entirely better than it. Correct. In a lot of ways. And I think that... I'm talking, of course, about Godfather Part 3. Of course. Yeah, without question. Um, <laughs> Definitely a masterpiece. So then they have this really interesting... So they come to the club um, and they're like, hey, we want to talk to you. And this is also where like Seymour Cassell kind of like... The gangsters come to the club. Yeah, shows it. that he's not somebody to be fucked around with, that he's somebody to be taken seriously. Seymour Cassell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they come to the... So, so they take him to this diner. And this is where the this is where the film scene. gets political. Why? So, the, so they say it right off the gate. We realize one thing off that the we gate. one right. I keep saying off the gate. Off the gate. One thing we notice. Um, there's a moment earlier in this, this podcast. Something that we should we should jump back and talk about that. They originally say to him, "Hey, listen. We need you to bring your girls to Chinatown, and br- and get them to bring this guy back to the club. Right. And he brings them to Chinatown, and they get Chinese food, and then." They're kind of sitting there and he goes there. He's like, what do you want to do? Do you want to go to a movie? And they're like, yeah, let's go see a Chinese movie. And then it cuts to them in a movie theater. And they've clearly sat through like several hours of movies. And you get this feeling that he's hesitated. Oh, of he, course. He doesn't, yeah, he doesn't actually want to go this. through with this. Yeah. Um, and they so rush back to the club for the show. And that's when Seymour Cassell and the goons come and take him to the diner. Right. But it, so at this point, obviously, they've told him. Yes. At this point, they've given the option of like, you don't have to kill him, but you have to draw him back to the club which they would probably kill him at the club yeah. and that is not what a club owner wants at his right. club but he, and they said something like oh well um, not forgive the entire debt right but like a lot of it he I wanted think. to pay down the debt right so then he doesn't do that yeah. he's clearly scared of doing that and in a way it's the right as a small business owner I'm just, well, please Liam I actually am not a small I own this podcast do you also by the way I like own this podcast <laughs> podcast podcast um, podcast um, so they take him to a diner and this is when the film Gets, gets suddenly suddenly has this very clear political undertone. So then they have this really yeah. So they basically talk to him about killing this Chinese bookie or what they say is a Chinese bookie. Um, but then there's all the, also all this talk about like violence against Asian people. Yeah, like because he says something like, "Oh, I was in Korea or something." Well, and, he, and they ask him how, and he said, "I killed, I shot a few, I killed a few people." Yeah, and they yeah. said, "How do you kill people?" And he said, "With an M1." And an M1 is like a stand was like a standard issue. I looked this up, I didn't know it was a standard so issue. Look that Army up, rifle. Look up the inflation rate. Tis, tis, guns, tis. guns, 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 guns. <laughs> um, so what we're suddenly re- we suddenly learned this guy's a, a veteran. Yeah, and so are most of the guys at this right. table. Right, and they talk about very briefly. I think they talk about World War Two. Well, Korea like, would have been a little later. No, no, no. But I thought one of the guys. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. the Thank you. But I thought one of the guys talked about because I thought they talked about also violence against Japanese people. Like yeah, he says like World War Two, and he uses that terrible term to refer to. Right. Yeah. It's, there's some racial racist language. Yeah. So, and, but this this is the part of the film is like, oh my god, this is where like the politics come come in, and where obviously you can read it. At least this film, let's say, or at least the scene, as obviously kind of some sort of commentary on Vietnam. Yes, totally. And it's interesting to think like, how old is Ben Gazar supposed to be? Because definitely not. He's in Vietnam. I mean, my Korea. Uh, Korea, right? Like. But Korea is what, 1950s? In the 50s, yeah. Like, um, so he's supposed to be a little older, but I don't think... Anyway, side note. But yes, he is a veteran of the Korean War. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, and this is, I think, where you get uh, Cassavetes, for the most part, kind of uh, actually saying something about... United States imperialism, <laughs> oh, <laughs> violence okay. against other uh, nations, I saw it especially, as, obviously, in the East. It's interesting because I saw it as being... I mean, that's clear but i think i also saw it as being a much more personal statement about politics and violence and, and stuff like that in, in the what sense way that, well you have this guy whose entire focus in life is creating a club like a show like a thing for people to escape their troubles when actually ben because cosmo vitale is like a pretty good killer he knows how to kill people, and he's good at it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And so it's kind of like... He's is, a killing is machine. He, he kind of is a killing machine. And there's an element to the... There's a there's a big quality to the last half of this movie being an action film on some level. Now, now I want to see like Ben Gazzara in uh, Die Hard. Ben Gazzara is 
John McClane. But I think in the last episode, I made a claim about Peter Falk and for Superman. No. And you were like, really? I was like, no. But Did now. Did you make a McLean? <laughs> I mean, a McLean. <laughs> but now I want to be like, oh man, I wonder what. Even if he was like in the 70s, I don't give a fuck. Ben Gazzaro ben would Gazzaro be a in pretty Die Hard. killer Lex Luthor. Oh, I see what you did there. I don't know what you did there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's all of a sudden there's this, we, we're revealed that he's a veteran and that he's... A killing machine. He's, he's, uh, he's killed some people. And they all kind of talk about that. So there's And they hand him a... No, oh, no, and just the sense of like... So the violence that he has obviously kind of inflicted in the name of United States imperialism is kind of... Uh, something that he could also en- enact on American soil against this person who he assumes to be just like a low-level uh, bookie, somebody of like absolutely no note. And it's interesting that they would talk about. Um, well, I guess it's it's yeah, I, so that's sort of that's sort of like somewhat that sort of went over my head in the sense that I was thinking more about like what it has to say about the way that people cultivate their lives after they go through really traumatic experiences or when they maybe kill for their for their country because he clearly also doesn't want to do this no he's it's not, not like he's it. like right, he great he's he spent his whole somebody. life trying to escape this thing but there's also the, some darker impulses you know one thing we didn't talk about is there's a scene earlier in the movie after he pays the guy off he goes into a club and orders orders a scotch and water and has a couple of them and he goes oh, and sits yeah. down on a table and this woman uh he's like what are you looking at yeah. and he goes i'm the king of the world i got I got balls, life by the balls. I got balls of steel or something. I and got life by the balls. Well, I got life by the balls, and then it cuts to him, and it's like, this is a sad guy. This is a guy that like totally goes yeah. and drinks by himself, yeah. uh, probably in the morning. But that's also the thing about like where he at times sad and lonely, and I. Well, that's also what's great about that first scene too, where he walks out. He says hi to his friend, and then he walks, and he's totally alone. Right, he's in the middle of this huge city. Yeah, you can hear the traffic. There's life bu- buzzing around him, but he's I shot. Think and we're he's alone very isolated. Now. See, I Even finally my got heart. the singing. And um, is she? Did Brittany write a sequel to that called like "Text My Heart," "Snapchat My Heart," "Snap oh, Snapchat <laughs> My Heart"? Even better. <laughs> Look at my jokes. Instagram My Heart. Oh my god. Instagram. Uh, Vine My Heart. So, then Vine they, My Heart. Then they put him in this car and they're like, "Here's what you're gonna do." So they give him the gun. They give him. They give him. They they put him in like an unmarked car. Give him the unmarked car. They give him details about the house. He knows. Yeah, he gets a lot of details. They give him the road map. They're actually like one of the things I like about this. <laughs> They're very th- well, thoughtful. The C- Seymour's like, <laughs> take a left here. You drive yeah. for about five minutes. Like they really give him the details. And I think it's actually because on some level these guys do like him. And I think that that's a nice distinction that from maybe some other film that like this would not get made now with the same kind of. I, I with the subtlety. Yeah, and just the fact like that the like people have conflicting feelings about stuff like this. Anyway, he sets out and almost immediately gets in a car. Wait, 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 hold the hamburgers. They also tell no, him you're to jumping, buy. You're jumping. No, no, no. Oh, they, they tell, tell him to buy. Tell him to buy hamburgers for the dogs. For the dogs, yeah, yeah. they tell him to buy twelve hamburgers, uh, not individually wrapped. We'll come up with we'll can come I also, up later. Yeah, because I, I I was looking at this bag that this guy wraps these twelve hamburgers in. Yeah. It was like those that those, there's no twelve hamburgers in there. Maybe okay. eight tops. And it's been a while since I've eaten like a real good, like meaty, juicy yeah, hamburger. You're, you're like, a vegetarian. Yeah, but I'm like, there's no fucking 12 hamburgers in that. Like, who are you fooling, Casa Casa movies. Casa movies. So he's driving to the, get the, he has to stop off. And to get the hamburgers. Gets in an accident. Yeah, it's accident. weird. You don't understand why, but he kind of like loses control of the car. Yeah, and he runs out of the car and then in runs the middle back of the highway. In the middle of the highway. And that's, it's actually really suspenseful because if you have to like, if your car stops on a highway in L.A., fucking forget about it. You're dead. Yeah. Why does he run back? Uh, well, he, what do you mean he runs back? He runs, he, he runs like off the, the highway. Yeah, but then he goes back to the car. Oh. I think to get the gun. Oh, maybe to get the gun. Maybe to get the gun. And I then he... Go ahead. Oh, no. I just don't remember him running back. And then there's and then a very pivotal scene. Right. Goes to the telephone. Calls right. a cab. Yes. And then calls the club. Which is amazing. Amazing. He's like, hey, Billy. <laughs> it's Cosmo. <laughs> Who's on stage? What number is that? He's like, is it the Paris number? The Paris number. You've worked here for seven yeah. years. And you don't know what the Paris... And, and he goes, again, it's just are there letters on the stage? P-A-R-I. <laughs> and it's such a good scene because it just goes to show you that like this guy's whole world is yeah. this club. And, like, I mean, he's literally about to kill someone to save the club. Totally. So the club... He hasn't been in that situation. By <sighs> every Thursday. So then he goes to the, <laughs> he goes to the hamburger joint. <laughs> he gets the hamburgers. And there's this... He's a testy exchange with the waitress. And this is actually apparently in the director's cut, or the longer... This is a much longer scene mm. in the longer cut of the film. Um, because there's this whole thing where he has this conversation. He's like, I don't want them individually wrapped. She's like, well, if you don't have them individually wrapped, how are people going to eat them? And he's like, just give them to me as yeah. they are. 
um and the and the bartender's like sort of apologizes to her yeah no apologizes to, to him, to him. Like, she didn't mean anything by it. And she comes back she's like hey mister i didn't mean yeah. anything by it and it's clear that there's something that's been cut out of yeah of the of the film and um, then he there but it's a nice little collision it's kind of like the mini in moscow it's timothy carey scene at the beginning with um not as gross not as gross <laughs> and what can not as, as much gross. happens but i thought I, I sat through sallow like totally fine like eating popcorn like oh this is this is an interesting pasolini film Mm. That scene in Mini Moscow, it's probably the most disgusting thing ever put on pretty, soil. <laughs> pretty, pretty gross. Pretty so gross. then he gr- he grabs the 12 hamburgers. Yes, he does. And it, um, I just love also the specificity of it. Like, it has to be 12 hamburgers. He goes. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it's not just like <laughs> buy a bunch of hamburgers. Just buy a bunch of raw meat. Yeah. He goes. Um, then he goes to the uh, bookie's house, which is like sort of a gated home with a yeah. long. It's like a bungalow. Yeah, and it's the the, the gangsters describe it like there's an A. I forgot how to do an A frame. An A frame, right? So there's like a house in the front, which is yeah. where like the henchmen hang the out. Henchmen live, and like the bookie and or the triad boss is in the back. Follows here is just like an extraordinary. Yeah. Scene well, before that, he it. feeds the dogs. So then he um he, he gets yeah he gets to the triad boss. You see him. The guy's like in a pool, pool bathtub with with a woman not um not uh age, age appropriate. appropriate. <laughs> yes, um, weird. Yeah, clearly, obviously, they've but been up to some. But he stalks through the house friskiness. and sort of like Metal Gear solids his way in and like <laughs> Very good sneaks reference. by like these these like sort of mob guys and like he kind of like at one point like I feel like he like he's like sort of lurking in a corner, much like John and McClane. One thing that I like about the action, the scenes in this film is I don't think John Cassavetes spent a bunch of time being like blocking i mean pl- blocking the camera i think he was like just let's just follow him around but he has such an innate ability to know where to put the camera that yeah. there's like very pedestrian sort of shots really work what's really great about it is that yeah it, it kind of just follows him and then there's this long pan the guy's the guy's in the pool and then it kind of pans up and you see him notice ben gazar yeah, yeah, yeah pans up yeah and then the guy's like I'm sorry, I don't know what I did. And then Gazara shoots him. Yeah, well, it's impo- well, he says something else right before that, too, right? It's also really interesting, too, that... So, I was again, reading the Carney book. Um, we should get some royalties for selling some books. Seriously. We sold two books. That Cassavetes was really um, having some um, doubts or questions about whether or not Gazara's character is actually going to kill uh, the bookie. Right. And that he was saying, like, up until, like, they filmed the scene, like, is he going to do it? Is he not going to do it? And he was, like, asking people, like, on the set, like, what do you think? What do you think? Would you kill the bookie? Should he kill the bookie? Would he not kill the bookie? Would oh, he go through wow. with it? Wow. Um, That's so interesting. So, yeah. because It's also really interesting because, again, like, was there not a script? Or no, there was, was he just kind a script, of, yeah. but I think... Maybe that's just the process he went Possibly. through of having to... Because there's a lot of doubt for him as a character. Totally, that yeah. And I forgot the, the mob boss says something else right he's before like, he says, I'm I, sorry. I d- he says something like, I didn't do... Uh, yeah, he sort of like starts to plead for his life. And, and Gazzara shoots, shoots him twice. And it's, and it's great too because you don't see him like topple over. You, you never don't, you don't see, see him, him get shot. And then, and then you notice that there's a woman standing off screen. Or she has been up to this point standing off screen. And he turns to look at her. And she runs away. And then he realizes, like, fuck, I got to get out of here. And he starts running. And he starts running, but not before killing two Two, more henchmen, which he was not was not on the list of things to do. But the kind of resolve that he has to get out of this situation, again, is a little bit of like a this is a guy that knows how to. And the way he does kill them, he he sort of plants himself. Yeah. Hears them running. And when they run the corner, he kills them. Like, it's a very it's not a mistake. It's a deliberate decision which, which again is interesting because again in the carney sorry to keep mentioning it but in the carney book cassavetti says something along the lines of that there was either a scene so maybe this is in the longer version or it wasn't filmed or it was filmed and it was cut out entirely from both right. versions where he says to like the henchmen like don't come in because i don't want to kill you or like i don't want any more violence um so that like the murder of those other two men are also kind of God, at least in one version good that it's that's cut out because i feel like i think would, so too yeah. yeah it might be a little too much so it kills them he escapes and he escapes by because he gets yeah, i think he sort of they, they sort of run in the wrong uh, the rest of the henchmen run in the wrong yeah. direction and he runs out he actually gets out i mean granted he kills two more people he gets on a bus he gets on a he gets on a bus but then quick quickly gets off the bus gets in a cab. to get into a cab and then he does something so smart so smart so he's driving along with the cab driver he sees a cab driver is not a movie theater and he's like yeah and he says oh, i feel like taking a movie stop here and he gets out and he starts to walk in and the cab pulls off and you realize he's done this i think to create like something of an alibi uh, huh. 
Huh. Oh, this, so wait, that like... That, oh, the guy sees me get dropped. Oh, he drops me off. Me. No, I was at the movies. This oh. cab driver knows he dropped me off. Uh-huh. Huh. Because then he quickly gets in another but cab. But then he right? doesn't buy a cab. Uh, movie theater, movie ticket. Yeah. So like that might have been his mistake. Hmm. Fascinating. Yeah, I don't know, but I, it felt like a very methodical move. Yeah, and, but then he also quickly gets in another um, cab. Less, right? it's a, it's sort of a, it's like a, uh, another I statement on Minnie and Moskowitz because Minnie and Moskowitz is all about the bullshit of the movies, and it's kind of interesting that maybe <laughs> he wants to, you know, I've I don't heard, know. I just read it as kind of like he's freaking out and s- indecisiveness of like, oh my god, what do I do? How do I it's get out? It's probably a clearer reading, but I almost read it as a very methodical decision. And then it cuts to the scene where the mobsters are at this hotel, at this hotel, at this restaurant. And, and the they get the news. They get the news, but all not only and this scene is mostly from Seymour Cassell's perspective, but what's interesting is one of the people at the m- hotel. First of all, is Zelmo from yes. Minnie and Moskowitz. Yeah. Zelmo from Minnie and Moskowitz shows up playing. So I think like the big big boss. I feel like he's oh, like really? King Koopa. Oh, I Maybe. just thought he was no. I thought the big big boss was one of the other guys. Oh, the guy with the white hair and the yeah, teeth and hair. yeah. Maybe, but I got a vibe that maybe Zelmo was was a bigger figure. But the other guy that who's there is the guy that he owed money to for seven years. Oh yes, yes, he gets that's introduced right, yeah. to the right. that guy there, and yeah, they kind of there's this really interesting scene where they get like that guy, the guy who owes who the guy who from the beginning of the film who owed. Who Cosmo owed money to, money to um, who he says has no style is like, hey, did you guys? It says to Kimor, Seymour Cassell and Zelmo from Minnie and Moscow, it's, hey, did you guys hear about? Um, did you guys hear about uh, the killing, the killing yeah. of a Chinese bookie? <laughs> <laughs> like, whoa! It gets really mad. And then at they that all point. look at the camera. Yeah. And he goes, "When will then be now? Soon." <laughs> what is that? Spaceballs? Oh, that's what right. Put like, like, what's going to happen there? Let's, let's put in the tape <laughs> the killing of a Chinese bookie <laughs> and find out what the hell is going to happen next. So he kind of like says, like, yeah, no, he, this Chinese mob boss got killed. And that's when you kind of find or you 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 infer that this guy's a bigger deal than yeah. they made him out to be. But um, And so Cassell gets this news, and it's very good news. <coughs> but then he walks over to Timothy Carey, yeah, who's having dinner. Great. And he's like, hey, idiot, you got to go kill this guy. Yeah. And he's like laughs. He's like, hey, you know what else is funny? You're going to have to go kill Vitelli. It's a really weird, really weird scene. But it's also kind of a cool scene in the context of the movie. Yeah. He goes to Rachel's mom's Oh, house that's right, yeah. Right. And Rachel's Rachel's mom is there. And she's kind of like, what happened to you? And, and he's he bleeding at this point. He won't tell her because he's yeah. been shot. We don't know he's been shot. We find out he's been shot in this scene. He's kind of laying on the bed. And she goes maybe to get like a, uh, something to dress the wound or whatever. And she says, like, you have to go to the hospital. And he just disappears. Yeah. And then he goes to the club. And Timothy Carey's there. Mm-hmm. And Timothy Carey and him start to talk. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. And then actually Rachel comes over and they sort of hold hands, uh, Cosmo and her. And like, again, it's just a reference to the fact that they're in a relationship, that they're whatever. And he and Timothy Carey leave and go to a garage. Yeah. Now, what do they talk about? I thought, wait, I didn't Cassell take? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, Terry Cassell, Carey Cassell does, comes yeah. later. Yeah, because... Yeah. Uh, I don't remember exactly what they're talking about, but th- it does kind of get. Well, there's a Marx reference. There is a Marx. Yes, I wrote it down here. I was like, "What the fuck does my handwriting say?" It's a, it's a nice Karl Marx. I Karl don't know. Marx. Karl Marx um, said that like religion is the opiate. Of the oh masses, yeah, but yeah. he's wrong. It's money. It's money. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of an interesting scene because you can if see. If only that Marx had written about money as well. If only. God, fuck. Yeah. What? What things he would have said? <sighs> he wrote all that stuff about. But clearly, he doesn't want to kill. He can't kill. Yeah, he's a phony. Vitelli. And this is such a big scene because like... It's a great scene. Because uh, Vitelli is like, you're a phony. Yeah. Like, I'm a killer. You're a fucking yeah, phony. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things that sort of speak to my, you know, not, well, I guess it's not a theory, but it is a little bit of the, one of the things that the movie is about is the idea that like, there's this kind of tragedy at the core of this guy's life, which is being a shell-shocked or recovering uh, murderer yeah. for, for U.S. imperialism yeah. who's decided that the only way to be happy is to like be an optimist hmm. and create this whole world out of this like, like shitty yeah. skeevy environment which again it makes it sort of a a metaphor for um for filmmaking or for art making or for believing the facade the artifice of it all oh, right yeah. that covers up some sort of like tragic, tragic yeah. thing and uh, it's just interesting that he's like you're a phony and so timothy gear goes to leave Yeah, of course. Huh. <laughs> so, um, Timothy Carey goes to leave. She does this and she screams. And, like, Ooh. and then she goes back to sleep. Yeah, I hope. So, Timothy Carey goes to leave. 
and pulling as he's pulling out of the garage, Seymour Cassell's pulling in. Yeah. <laughs> and it's good. Think the guy goes, that guy in there, he's my friend. <laughs> you deal with him. <laughs> and he drives <laughs> off. And uh, it's almost like a Curb Your Enthusiasm <laughs> moment. It's like, son of a bitch. <laughs> 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 and Seymour Cassell's like, now I'm going to have to kill him. And so he pulls in and he's followed by another one of the henchmen. That's right. Seymour yeah. Seymour Cassell like is get, gets killed like uh, very quickly. And kind yeah, of well, like he's kind of like, hey, man, I like you. Like, yeah. we can, I know you want to kill me, but like, I've always liked you, whatever. And then the other guy makes a move and Cosmo kills Kill. Seymour Cassell. Yeah. Shoots him in the car. And then we spend about two to three minutes following this other henchman as he looks for Cosmo. And he's clearly like, he's outwitted this other guy. Like, because at this point, Gazara is like, um, he's in killer murder mode. He's in killer yeah, mode. Yeah. And if he doesn't get caught, interestingly, he doesn't kill this guy. But this guy's like, probably time for us to talk. And my reaction yeah. was like, okay, bud, like, <laughs> you're fucked. But he leaves and goes to the club. Right. And uh, and this is where the film kind of like uh, com- wait, but so when where's the scene with the mom? So he goes back over to the mom's before house before the club, before the club, and, this and is Rachel is flips out. Rachel is there. Okay, yeah, and this is where he yeah they have the falling out, and she and Rachel's like, what's going on? And the mom knows that something's going on, but because she's seen the bullet, the wound, but he won't tell her, and uh, he starts talking about his parents. He's like, my dad was yeah. a bastard, and we sort of get a sense that like. Again, this guy's broken a little bit. There's mm-hmm. something at his core that isn't quite sort of, sort of the first time in the film he's kind of honest about himself. Like he talks about himself. About in himself. A really yeah. Personal way. Well then the last like so obviously he's bleeding and he's dying, so it is very much a kind of I guess uh confrontation with mortality. Something like that. So they have a falling out. He right. treats her uh, like uh terribly. Um he kind of yells at her. And then he um, leaves. And yeah. she says, Don't come around. Don't here come around anymore. anymore. And this is probably the closest thing to a family that this guy has. He goes back to the club. And well, the club is kind of like his family. That's true. Well, but at least in this scene, you get that spent a lot of time with feeling. the club. But when he gets to the club, all the patrons are just clapping. And it's because no one's on stage. Because Mr. Sophistication refuses to go on stage. Yeah. And so... I also love the fact that this guy thinks like they're all there for him. Because he apparently has a line about something. <laughs> so that then they're all like in the dressing room. Yes. And like Cosmo's kind of talking to them, like trying to like sort He's out their their get, shit. And there's this, this is this is really the scene that puts the movie over the top, I think. But yeah, the guy won't go on stage because he doesn't feel as though he's taken seriously, yeah. and like, <laughs> you know. And he's a really like depressing, buffoonish, like loserish kind of. One of the things this movie is about is like delusions of grandeur, and then yeah. just like plain delusion, and just being like he's kind of the big deal there. And I don't know, there's something about like how he kind of ignores his surroundings and like looks to the glory of what he does but like he's actually quite bad at it so yeah it's yeah not a good club not a good yeah um, well, he's, he's there to be made, made fun of yeah he's it's a buffoon great, it's just buffoon. great because at the um as, as the french would say we mm. oui. <laughs> so there but it's just great because he thinks like oh the, the, the pra- patrons are also here to see me and gazara has this amazing speech where he's like my f- my truth is your yeah. is your falsehood falsehood and your falsehood is my, my truth. truth i'm only happy when i'm angry yeah which All is this great it's like a great like paradoxical line yeah. it's a really paradoxical line about how like Oxymoronic. i don't know it's sort of about it's sort of about this he's maybe he's been denying his nature or that he's maybe he he created this circumstance he put himself in the position to kill this guy because he had ev- everything was going fine for him, and what did he do? He went and Fucked gambled up, himself yeah. into twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars debt because I think he believes in this world where like you can pick women up and go to a, a legal store, whatever. I don't know. It just it it There's spoke to the kind of broken quality yeah, of this world that right. this film takes place. I'm talking a lot. Sorry. No, no, no. But but again, it goes back to this like interesting. He's not like an awful human being in the way that let's no. say. Um, Gazara's character in Husbands is, he's very much. Well, I mean, I, can, I mean, I don't it deals know, with like a kind of repression. He, and yeah, it do, right, yeah. But I don't actually think. I think it's much more like tragic. You know, it, yes, I think so too. Because I think that one of the things that makes this tragedy is that it's there's n- this isn't. I don't know. I don't know. But in Husbands, there's so many outs. There's so many ways out for that guy. Uh, in the sense that like he doesn't have to behave the way that he does but i think well actually i don't know i mean what are the parallels between the two characters i'm not really sure but there is something really tragic about this guy maybe because he has something he really wants and that like anchors him yeah yeah and you don't have that as much in husbands yeah 
And then, so he rallies the troops. They put on like uh, one more show. Right. He um introduce he comes and goes back down to the stage. He kind of gives his like speech where he's like you know it's like a lab- oh he buys a round for everybody in the a house. Lot more in the club. He buys everyone a round because yeah. he knows he's gonna die. He's die. Right. <laughs> which is great. It's like fuck it, I'll buy everybody a round. Right, right, right. Um, which is also great too because he's still piling up on the, the debts. <laughs> while he's the dying. Debts. Well, he owns all the booze. You'd assume. <laughs> yeah. But and he, then he walks outside. And he walks outside. Um, and, and he, he reaches, reaches into, into his, his pocket, pocket. And he's bloody. And he's blood. And and then. And you don't know. Uh, yeah. It, it ends, ends in this with ambiguous Mr. Note. Sophi- sophistication in singing front. in a medium close up. And one of the women comes up and lights like a false fire on his shoulder. Yeah. His hair sort of catches on fire. And his hair is, he's all sweaty and, and kind of gross. And he walks off. And that's the end that's of the, the movie. That's the end. Yeah. Wow. The end. Fiend. So, Liam. Yes. Final thoughts? Uh, I want to hear your thoughts. So on the Johnny Staccato scale. Sure. Can I get a, a drum beat, please? Drum roll. <laughs> I give this five out of five Staccato. Wow, you really like this one. I fucking love this movie. I think this is my favorite Casabetti's film. Why do you love it so much? So what I really liked about it is that it felt really tight and controlled in yep. a way that so many of the other films did not. Previous to this. Yeah, I felt like the existential kind of um, themes are i don't know man they're just like they're very rooted in reality too yeah they're very rooted in reality i mean again i like i said i was kind of like i was saying earlier i kind of hate i hate kind of hate like ranking those things or ranking films or just kind of saying like well this film is better than this film but um i mean you can obviously say that of course about so many things and be uh truthful but i i don't know that like this film really kind of like stood out to me like this is i think the casavetti's film that i could come back to over and over and over again and probably not get bored of it. It's a pretty good entertainment. In the same way that I could say about like Faces or um, mm-hmm. even Minnie Mouse Quits. And I love Minnie Mouse Quits. And I would be like, oh, I could see Minnie Mouse Quits well, Minnie Mouse is a lot more extreme. <laughs> than this film about murder? Well, I think in the sense that like... Um, it's very over the top yeah, in certain it's not ways. Real, it's not like a... F- well, I don't know if this is a fun watch, but like it doesn't have the same... I mean, I really think a big... I have to... Be Really, co- I think a big part of why this movie works so well is Ben Gazzara. Totally, so fucking good. Yeah, I mean, it's truly one of the best performances I've ever seen. In and also, film. I think obviously the it's interesting to think that within, let's say, the confines of the genre, that yes. Cassavetes is able to kind of also restrain himself a little bit. Yeah, it is a very restrained movie, and you know, it's like who would have thought that like a p- sort of clear plot would be the best thing for a guy like John Cassavetes you know I was thinking about this especially as we think about like our feelings about maybe the second half of Husbands and how it feels a little indulgent and long yeah I don't think uh, any of us are at any point in in our conversations about these films have we denied that despite some of the maybe maybe what would be considered indulgences and in length and and scenes in some of the films they never feel anything less than convincing it's all very convincing but this is the first film where there's like a real clean story story structure that's built around some conventions that yeah. are really interesting and that helps the narrative um, it yeah. helps us it also helps us like to digest some of the thematic stuff going on in the totally. movie i was reading some uh, i've been reading some um like uh science fiction mm. uh, the science fiction novel by uh kim stanley robinson um but it's also really interesting because at some point i was like oh the war- the warm embrace of genre fiction <laughs> like the warm embrace you of like fucking dick. Of <laughs> so pretentious <laughs> of like a genre no well that's what i'm trying to say i'm not pretentious because uh um, comment- <laughs> genre <laughs> no i'm kidding no but it is really nice but just yeah to have like let's say um then what i'm trying to say is like restraints and, con- and constraints are not necessarily things that limit you right like sh- like in the sense of like working within a genre it's really a great movie Really, a it truly is. great movie. Yeah. Um, up next. Jeez, opening night. I was Liam Billingham, and I, st- I still am George Fragopoulos. But you're a killing machine. Oh, you know it. This was Uberbusters. Yeah. Well, before that, he feeds the dogs. Did you also yeah. notice one of these dogs? One of these dogs uh, will go on to work in the uh, Reagan administration. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, I believe. Uh, How long did you work on that joke? <laughs> It took me hours. So he feeds the dogs. He goes.
<laughs> I just like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the Reagan administration, am I right? It's like I was listening to like the best of Carson, <laughs> something like so Secretary of <laughs> Commerce. <laughs> oh, so who's in from out of town? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're leaving.